their side but Roma scored the only goal and Paolo Di Canio was probably the best player on the pitch. Of late, the excitable former Celtic player Di Canio has developed a habit of performing the ancient Roman salute. Something like that. Of course, this affectation was popularised by Mussolini and the fascists. Now, Di Canio admits to being a fascist, but he says the gesture has no political significance whatsoever. It's just a symbol that he shares with the fans. Di Canio's first and foremost a Lazio supporter and secondly a Lazio player. The only thing about Di Canio, he's become much more controversial, obviously, because of the, the fascist salute. He first uh, uh, produced for us at the end of the Derby last season in January, January of 2005 uh, and then he's done it again twice this season. Now he said he's not going to do it anymore. A player who did a similar symbol but one that evokes you know, uh, communist pol politics which is Lucarelli of Livorno. Livorno are very left-leaning uh, fans and they do the, the Che Guevara raise, raise fist. When he scored a goal he would, he would do this and the league uh, find him as well because you know they wanted to seem even-handed. This is the Lazio training camp on our right, sealed from the prying eyes of the public. It's like a, a very bad man's compound in a James Bond film. It's perplexing to a lot of people because they think, well, you know, how can someone like Di Canio, who's lived such a cosmopolitan life, living in London for a long time, you know, travelling the world, how can he um, espouse such an extreme polit political viewpoint? In Rome, I think it's much easier to belong to a political, to an extreme political ideology. It's almost as if it's just a name and people don't actually take it seriously or what it actually implies. But people here will quite happily talk about being far right or fascist or a communist on the other side of the spectrum. Uh, in a way that you wouldn't find in, say, I don't know, British or Irish society. You know, people tend to be much more mainstream. And there are a lot of potential reasons for that. One is the fact that in the 70s there was this enormous political polarization between the anarchists on one hand and the neo-fascists on the other. And the other is the, uh, the, the fact that uh, the, the middle of the political spectrum has been so demonstrably rubbish for years. I don't know, corrupt, corrupt ineffective, you know, plainly one side doing deals with the other jumping ship whenever necessary. If you have a political belief, it's just not going to be in the middle. You're either on one side or the other. I caught up with a chastened Di Canio at a press conference. Only last week, the mayor of Rome invited him and players from both teams to meet with Holocaust survivors to try and eradicate the fascist and racist symbolism that bedevils football. But Paolo refused to discuss his political beliefs. What about a light-hearted religious question? Paolo, uh, parla inglese for your <coughs> Irish fans? Yeah, OK. Oh, thank you. How does this game compare to the Glasgow derby? I think uh, it's a little bit different because um, in uh, Glasgow um, it's not about only football. We're talking about a political situation and a religion situation. So there is a, a, diff a different reason why um, there is a big passion also in Glasgow for a derby. Do you remember the words of the fields of Athen Rye? Uh, yeah. Yeah, the song uh, is a fantastic song, but uh, at the moment I'm concentrating for this derby and I want to think all about it. Sunday, what, what songs will you sing if you win? A Roma, la Lazio, c'è solo la Lazio. Only this song. It means uh, in Rome there is only Lazio. In the second half, both sets of fans continued to wage massive text message war. On the field, Lazio kept trying, even without the ageing Di Canio, and were unlucky not to equalise. Surprisingly, Italian football has more goals per game than the Premiership or Spain's La Liga. They just don't produce defenders like they used to, as Lazio will confirm. mild-mannered local commentator takes up the story. Well, that's it. Roma won 2-0. It was also a victory for the city of Rome, 
there was no violence as fans and police behaved impeccably. The story is all about Totty and 11 wins on the trot. How do you sum up a goal, a match, a whole race of people? It's impossible. Suffice to say, Roma added another modest layer of history to this glorious artichoke of a city. The injured Totty was fated like a Borgia prince. Much maligned Di Canio was the most talented player on the field. And you need to have something, you know, that uh, takes you away from the problems, from, from everyday problems, from the life that is not so happy and uh, all these kind of things and football is probably that corner in which everybody can be kid again. It's a big love that we have for our city and we bring it wherever we go. Il nome della nostra città. Dunque facciamo un augurio a tutti gli sportivi perché lo sport sia un mezzo. I just want to wish that through sport we can do some good and help people that need it. And also through sport young people can better themselves and get off the street. E trovare meglio e non stare per strada. Writer Tim Parks makes the observation. Football provides the Italians with exactly what they crave. A flip-flop between triumph and sadness, piety and profanity, left and right, north and south, all the grievances imaginable. As I depart from the eternal city, with a tinge of regret, there's no doubt about it when it comes to bread and circuses, the Romans know how to put on a show. Next week, Ardell visits Poland and the city of Krakow, the birthplace of John Paul II, for the bitter derby between the city's two rival teams, known locally as the Jews and the Dogs. Tragic story in the newspaper. Totty's library has burnt down. It contained two books. He is inconsolable. No, he cried. I hadn't finished colouring in the second one yet. <laughs>